to hear that just for a minute, just for a minute. I had to hear that. I haven't listened to it, listened to it in quite some time. Prayerfully hour. The Lord will allow our choir back in to do that song again. Maybe we'll just see if we can get the praise team to do it. Um, we're in the book of John. We're in the book of John and we are starting in verse number six. My aim is to get as close as I can to the, to the, to the end of the prologue from John chapter one. Verses 1 through 18 is the prologue for the book. Gives you, gives you the, the intro. Jesus being the Son of God and his witness testifying to that fact. Amen. Um, Jesus being God in the flesh. And the witness, John the Baptist, testifying to that fact. Jesus's forerunner, if you will. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bible over to John chapter 1, the gospel according to John chapter 1. And we'll be reading in your hearing verse number 6. I know it's not uh, Friday. Um, and I said that because at Central State, we have what we call Maroon and Gold Fridays. And so every Friday, a whole bunch of alumni, some students get up, get put on their Central State paraphernalia, and they, and they say Maroon and Gold Friday. So we, it's been going on for quite some time. Sometimes you'll see me post it on my page. So it's Maroon and Gold Wednesdays, amen, <laughs> for me, all right? Uh, John chapter 1, starting at verse number 6, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We love you because you are our peace. You are all of our holiness. You are our righteousness. You are our Savior. Thank you, O oh God, for these moments that we are able to step aside and really delve into your word and block out everything else. Open us up now, O oh God, to receive your word, that we may take the words from the pages of your book and place them on the stages of our lives. We love you, Lord, and we lift our voices to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoices. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound to your ear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John chapter 1, starting at verse number 6, says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same was for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light with which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. I want to stop there, and then we'll kind of dig a little, and then hopefully uh, do like the, 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 the famous Fairfield Four, and we'll dig a little deeper. Amen? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, John chapter 6, chapter 1, starting in verse number 6, uh, we see that God fulfills prophecy by sending a forerunner that was foretold back in Malachi, back in Isaiah, a forerunner who would, who would actually herald the name of the light, J 
Jesus Christ. The text is specific in pointing out that John the Baptist, the Baptist was not that light, but was still sent from God to bear witness of the light. Now let's 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 look at it a little bit. Um, the ministry of John the Baptist. John was sent as a witness to tell people that he, that the light had come into the world, right? Because of course we know that God was a light to the to the Israelites, to to the Hebrews, to Moses, and and to those prophets, and to Ezekiel. We know that God was a light for them. We know that God was direction for them. But now the light has come in the manifested presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ. All right. The nation of Israel, in spite of all of its spiritual advantages, was blind to their very own Messiah. The word witness is a key word in the book. John uses it about 14 times and the verb 33 times. Uh, John the Baptist was one of many people who bore witness to Jesus. This is the son of God. Now, um, as you look at it, John the Baptist went so far to press them into seeing the light. He even was martyred by the Jewish leaders who did nothing to prevent him being killed. John the Baptist, one crying in the wilderness, eating locusts and honey. The kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. They were, they were trampling over each other to go hear this preaching because it had been 400 years since he came, uh, since John the Baptist. It had been 400 years of silence where there was no, and the word of the Lord came unto. They rejected the Messiah and martyred his witness. Mm. Why did the nation of Israel reject Jesus Christ? Because the Bible says they knew him not. They were spiritually ignorant and that uh, ignorant to the fact of Jesus Christ being the light. Um, it was kind of like they had or placed more weight in the light of Moses, the light of Abraham, the light of Jacob the light of the prophets, the light of the Torah, the scriptures, they place more weight in the light of the rituals, the light of the temple. But they did not place any weight in the light of all of those things that pointed to the manifested light, Jesus Christ. Because all of those things pointed to this very moment in John chapter 1, when the word was made flesh, John is witnessing to them about this light and they rejected it. Now listen to it in the text. It says that all men through him might believe. Now you remember when we talked about the summary of the entire book. So you see a glimpse of it here that witnesses bear light so that all men through Jesus' light, through his light, might believe. You and I have a responsibility as we walk and live and move to be a witness to the true light, the manifested presence, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The text says that that was the life of John says that it was a true light which lights every man, King James Version says lighteth every man that comes into the world or cometh into the world. All right? So, 
We all are exposed to the light. But everybody does not accept the exposure. Okay, now let me say that again. There were, that was the true light, verse number nine, which lights every man that comes into the world. Everybody is exposed to the light. But everybody doesn't receive the light. We're going to say that we're going, we're going, we're going to see that. We're going to see that. Now, John bears record initially to be sure to move himself behind the true light. So it's almost like uh, uh, if you if you remember those uh, those old English movies uh, that had hierarchy, uh, old. British movies that had hierarchy, uh, kings or monarchy system, kings and queens. Well, whenever they would get ready to make a grand entrance to a ball or to a marriage or to a banquet, whenever they were making a grand entrance and uh, uh, just just re-entering from battle or any kind of grand entrance or going into a new town, they always had one who came and they would have uh, uh, trumpets playing, you know, they'd play some kind of anthem and then they would have somebody to announce that the king was coming, right? Um, you kind of see it when, when the House of Representatives and the Senate gets together and, and the president is always fashionably late and right before he comes in, there's one person that comes out and introduces and, and they'll come out and say, ladies and gentlemen, please stand because coming now is the president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, <laughs> right? Right. So, so, uh, uh, John the Baptist is that person who walks into the room before Christ and announces that the light is coming. Amen. Somebody that that's, that's how that kind of looks from the Old Testament, and they even share that practice right now. But this particular way that John the Baptist does it is so different from what had previously been done. Why? Because now God is coming in the flesh to take care of the sins of the world. Right? Uh, I was having a discussion with another one of my preacher friends earlier today about um, how 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 I kind of did it in a children's class. And so what I did was I took a, a a blank piece of paper and I set a quarter down, and I would and I took a pencil and I I I, I scraped it over that quarter with the sheet of paper down to, until the image of that quarter came into the paper, right? And then I, I lifted the paper up and then I lifted the quarter up. And I said, a good example of seeing what Christ looks like in the flesh is some people believe that Jesus Christ is the paper, the replica of the quarter. God being the quarter. But that's not what the text tells us. The text tells us that Jesus Christ is not a copy. Jesus Christ is the quarter brought forth to us. Amen. So if I were to place the quarter in one of the young people's hands, that would be Jesus Christ being placed in his hand or her hand. Jesus Christ being brought forth and placed in our presence. Uh, uh, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, the son of God, full of grace and truth, right? So that's literally what God shows us in the person of Jesus Christ, the manifested presence of God in the flesh, right? So, so here it is. Um, as you study John's gospel, you'll find that Jesus teaching the people that he is the fulfillment of all that was typified in the law. It was not enough to be born Jew. 
they had to be born again from above. We'll get to that in John 3, Nicodemus' story. He deliberately performed two miracles on the Sabbath to teach them that he had a new rest to give them in John chapter 5 and in John chapter 9. He also satisfied that he was the manna from heaven on high when he when he fed the 5,000 in John chapter 6. Hmm? Then he shows us that his manifested presence, all of those signs and all of those wonders that happened in the Old Testament, Jesus is now coming into this chapter or this book to fulfill those things and also demonstrate who he is before the people that rejected him. He shows them he's the living water in John chapter 7, 37 through 39, right? He shows that he is the new vine in John 15, right? He shows that he's the shepherd, well, shepherd of a new flock before John 15. He shows that he's the shepherd of the flock in John 10 and 16, right? And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be of one, be one fold and one shepherd. And he's a new vine in John 15. But the people, John the Baptist's day, were so shackled by religious tradition that they could not understand the spiritual truth found in Jesus Christ, right? So, so notice, the Bible teaches us that he was in the world. We gave the replica an uh, example. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not, right? They saw his works, heard his words. They observed his perfect life. He gave them every opportunity to grasp the truth, believe and be saved. Jesus is the way, but they would not walk with him. John chapter 6, 66 through 71. He is the truth, but they would not believe him. In John 12, 37. He is the life, and they crucified him. Hmm. John 12 and 13 gives us a marvelous promise of God of anyone who would actually receive him. Okay, so let's let's look at this a little bit more. He was the true light. He was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. What I want us to know is that even though you reject him, or I reject him, or the sinner rejects him, it doesn't diminish the fact of who he is. Amen? And praise God that we've received him, right? But there are many who still reject him. But I want you and I to know so that as witnesses of Jesus Christ, he's still shining. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. He came to his own. And his own received him not. We kind of broke that down. And then uh, it says in 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them gave he, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Right? So it's, it is by faith that acts activates the salvation we receive, right? And then it's the power of a faith that God now brings us in to make us sons of God, right? To every believer that believes on his name. Now, notice in verse 13, which we're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, 
but of God. Now, this is really something that we have to deal with because the world now is so tainted with attempting to be God. That's why you have a lot of people who say, hey, hey, I, I was I, I was born uh, with, a, with, the, with the, all the male parts, but I'm not a man. Or you'll, you'll have a woman who says, I, I, I was born without any plumbing, but I, I, I am a man. But the text says, you can be born again. <laughs> because when you're born, you were born, when you're born in Jesus Christ, I should say, it was not by blood of your parents, nor by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man. See, because we did not create ourselves, we don't have the jurisdiction or the right to choose what we are. God already made that decision for us. When he formed us in our parents' womb, or mother's womb, I should say. <laughs> Watch this. Because it's by the will of God. Now, to fix it all up, liars are in the same bucket. Thieves are in the same bucket. Murderers, mm -hmm, murderers are in the same bucket. Rapists are in the same bucket. It's all sin. Homosexuality in the same bucket. See, because I, I, I notice a lot of times we were so hard on certain sins. But the scripture is clear when it says all sin stinks in God's nostrils. Hmm? So it's not the big white lie or the little black one. Hmm? It doesn't make a difference. It's all sin. But what's so gracious about God is that we were born in sin. Amen, somebody? So it's not an unnatural response to life to live in sin. Why? Because our nature is to sin. That is why God, God's manifested presence in the person of Jesus Christ by the will of God, has made a way for all of us to be born again. Amen, somebody. And we'll kind of get into that discussion when we get to John chapter 3 and we talk, start talking about the Nicodemus story. But, but here in our text, uh, we see that it was God's will to make sure that everybody has a way to get back to him through Jesus Christ. Yes, because the scripture in Romans says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that amazing? That now, because... Jesus came into the world. Now we can call on the Lord to be saved. Now that may be, you know, just repeated news to most of you because, you know, many of us that listen to preaching or teaching are Christian, right? But this is not to inspire you to be saved again because you can only be saved once. It's really to inspire us to let somebody else know what happened to us. Amen. That's being a witness like John, huh? huh? Ain't that good? Now, we, we know the word was made flesh, verse number 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. Uh, Peter says, the word of life to whom we have seen with our eyes, handled with our hands, right? Uh, you see it in Acts chapter 1. Those that accompanied uh, with us from the time of the mountain of transfiguration all up until he was carried up out of Calvary. Amen. All right. Carried up out of Galilee in front of all of those people. Hmm? After he rose from the dead. So, so here in the text, he came. Now, verse 15 says, John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake that had come, come, cometh after me is preferred before me for he was before me. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. Uh, uh, John the Baptist was actually born six months before Jesus. Find that out in Luke 1.36. So this statement he's referring to is our Lord's pre-existence, not his birth date. Amen, somebody. Because Jesus Christ is eternal God in the flesh. Amen. Amen. Right? Right? So, so John is really giving us his eternal picture. Right? But there's also the fullness of grace and truth. Right? Uh, and, and verse number 17, it says, uh, no, verse number 16, it says, and all his fullness have all we received of grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right? So the fullness of grace and truth Grace is God's favor and kindness bestowed on those who do not deserve it and cannot earn it. It's, it's, it's imputed. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's given to us, all right? Uh, if God dealt with us only according to truth, everybody would go to hell. Right? He, but he deals with us on the basis of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection, met all the demands of the law. Now God is free to share the fullness of his grace with those that trust in his salvation, Jesus Christ. Grace without truth would be deceitful. And truth without grace would be condemning. All right? Uh, I want to say that again. Grace without truth would be deceitful. Deception. But truth without grace would condemn us. Why? Because the truth of the matter is, is without Jesus Christ, nobody, would have access to God and salvation. That's the truth. Because the law would re then require our death because we break it all the time. Amen, somebody, amen. All right, John, and one, John 1 and 17. John did not suggest that there was no grace under the law of Moses, because there was. See, some people don't believe that there was grace in the Old Testament. But uh, uh, the Israelites got plenty of it. Amen? Uh, we don't have time to go through all of the grace that they received. But you and I both know. <laughs> Just read it. He, he gave them grace as well. Each sacrifice. Each sacrifice. If we just go back and look at the sacrifices. Was an expression of the grace of God. Hmm. The law also revealed God's truth, but in Jesus Christ, grace and truth reached their fullness. 
So he did offer grace to those of those patriarchs and matriarchs in the Old Testament. He did offer the truth to them. But when we get to Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. It is the fullness of grace and truth for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right. Now, finally, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, hath declared him. Here it is. Jesus Christ reveals God to us. As to his essence, you can't see God. He's invisible. First Timothy 117. Now unto the king internal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Mm. Hebrews 11 and 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endued as seeing him who is invisible. All right. Man cannot see God revealed. Man can see God revealed in nature. Right? Romans 1, it says they are without an excuse. And in his mighty works in history, but he cannot see God himself. Jesus Christ actually reveals God to us, for he is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1, 15. Not to say he's a replica like our quarter example, with the sheet of paper and the quarter. Not to say he's a replica, but he is the express image. Uh, uh, you see, his uh, you see declared, for he he had declared him, Father. He had he had declared him. It gives us our English word exegesis. That's that word declared. It gives us our English word exegesis, which means to explain or to unfold. Or to lead the way. And Jesus, of course, is all that. Right? <laughs> all right. Jesus explains God to us and he interprets him for us. We simply cannot understand God apart from knowing his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, son is used for the first time in John's gospel as a title for Jesus Christ. The phrase only begotten means unique. The only one of its kind. That's what only begotten means, all right? So, it doesn't suggest that there was a time when Jesus was not. And then the Father brought him into being. Jesus Christ is eternal God. He has always existed, all right? We're getting uh, close to our time here. Son of God, you see Son there. In John's Gospel, nine times Jesus is called the Son of God throughout the Gospel, right? So, so we will see that and kind of dig a little bit more on this on next week as we leave the prologue and go into our first phase of of the um, of the Gospel of John. All right, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, seems like getting uh, tired. I, this is a pre-record, saints, and, and it's really, really early in the morning. Praise the Lord. But I, this is when I do my work. I love it. I love it. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much now for allowing us this time to be with you. I ask that you touch each and every person that will watch these videos and let them, oh God, receive your word. Let them be what you would have them to be. Oh God, I ask that you strengthen us. Keep us in your keeping care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen. Share our app. Text HGMBC to the number 54244 and download our new church app. Make it part of your homepage where you can just jump on every time. 
I'm going to have some new things coming down the pipe real soon. I want you to pray for something for me right before we go. Um, I want to kind of do some praying before our Bible study in lieu of our Monday through Friday, 730 to 8 o'clock. I haven't made a decision yet. I'm talking to the Lord about it. But I want you to pray with me on that. Can you do that? All right. God bless you. You all have a great evening.